happy to have three presenters today from the university's Center for Livelihoods and Ecology, Brian Belcher, Tim Brigham, and Jenny Siglet. And they're going to talk about their experience w with the Rural Opportunities Network website. And the presentation will be about 45 minutes, with about 15 minutes after for questions. Um, help yourself to the coffee there. And I just want to let you know that it's also being filmed. Thanks. Over to you guys. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. And uh, to those that are time shifting and watching this later, great. Welcome as well. Uh, so I've got the easy job. We're going to kind of tag team this presentation. I was just going to provide a little bit of context about the development of this, of this website. And then Jenny will walk you through and, and show a few examples of some of the different uh, kinds of uh, content that we have there. And it's really coming together nicely. And then Tim's going to talk about some of the lessons learned about putting together a website like this. Uh, and I think there's, you know, some important lessons there uh, about the, the costs, the, the constraints, the difficulties, but also some of the some of the, the opportunities that something like this creates. The center uh, that we work in is currently called the Center for Livelihoods and Ecology. It was started as the Center for Non-Timber Resources in 2004, uh, with the idea that there's a whole wide range of resources coming from forests and other natural environments, wild foods, medicinal and aromatic plants. Uh, structural materials, decorative ma materials, a whole range of things that, uh, that are used by many different people. There's a whole range of constituencies that, are, that value these resources for a lot of different purposes, from traditional and sacred uses through to recreational purposes through to uh, commercial uses. But that this sector, and I'll, I'll use the air quotes because it really isn't a sector, but it's a broad range of sort of constituencies and, 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 and products and, and different markets, but the sector is under-researched, really under-recognized, and under-supported. And we thought that there was potential there and a need for research and the kind of thing that Royal Roads can do. Applied research that will help to, to uh, create new opportunities, overcome constraints, um, and, and maybe also do some, some, some work to advocate for greater uh, support through policy change and so on. Uh, so we renamed the Center, uh, the Center for Livelihoods and Ecology in 2011 to kind of reflect a broader focus and a broader mandate. And under these two names, the Center has really undertaken a wide range of research on, on natural resources management, ecology and management research, research on policies and institutions, as well as quite a bit of extension work. And, and, and that's really where this idea comes from, the idea that when we do this research, we recognize that we need to also make sure that it's getting to the people that need to use it. And a lot of those users are in rural and remote places and don't have easy access to information. So how can we get it to them in a way that's effective and uh, easy and hopefully not too uh, uh, um, difficult and make a kind of a one-stop shop? Um, we've done a lot of different kinds of outreach. Tim's been involved in a lot of training at the community level. We've developed training materials. We've done uh, reviews of, of curricula and help support, for example, curriculum on, on some of uh, non-timber forest products for use in, in, in uh, elementary and, and middle school and that sort of thing. For those of you that have been around a while, you'll recognize this. This is the last issue of a, a series, an annual uh, directory uh, that we produced. Um, that, that, that gave a place for businesses to advertise their different kinds of products. But we, we had to stop publishing it because it was too expensive. And so we asked, how can we do this in another way that's less expensive? Could we do this online? And from there, we kind of slipped into the 21st century and started thinking about a, an online uh, platform. So it's a context of increasing interest and demand for natural products, uh, increasing interest in rural diversification, a growing information base, but it's scattered and difficult to access for a lot of people. There's a lot of different potential users, resource managers, small-scale uh, resource-based entrepreneurs, rural development officers, First Nations communities need this kind of access to plain language information in a, in, in a, in a single site or at least through a single portal. And we also thought there's a need for more uh, knowledge exchange and networking. We'd like to uh, encourage more engagement and uh, an opportunity to build this directory idea. And so we got, uh, we put some grant applications, we got funding from SHRC, we got funding from the Rural Secretariat, which is a, an agency of uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. We got support from a no number of other uh, funders like Alex Campbell, we have an endowment and we used some of that funding, Van City, uh, RBC, and in-kind contributions from, from some of our partners. 
I'm not going to talk about all of those partners. I think that will come out as the presentation goes on. But basically the intent when we developed this website was to collate, summarize, and organize information that's uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a single location, including links to other sources of information, and a lot of that is what the, the network and the web is about. Uh, develop a web-based platform, what we first started calling a knowledge center, and we're now calling the Rural Opportunities Network, and market this knowledge center or the Rural Opportunities Network to, to uh, various users. We've, we've, got a, we've got a good uh, advisory board. We've done the work now to develop the platform, and you're soon going to see uh, what, it, what, what it is and what, what's there. Um, what I would like to do be, before I uh, turn the stage over, though, is, is uh, ask you to think about a question as we go through this demonstration. And that is, I mean, we started this as a way to disseminate information and research that we produced, but also to link to other information that, that other collaborators and other researchers have done. We think it's a really useful idea, and we, it's something that we would like to encourage more engagement within the Royal Roads community. So the question to think about is, could this platform work more broadly within, within Royal Roads? I think that a lot of the research that we do, faculty and students as well, in our sustainable communities, livelihoods and environment theme is, is perfectly well suited to a platform like this, but also research that's done in some of our other themes. So as you have a look at what we've got here and what we've done so far, and it really is still developing, and I think it's the kind of thing that will snowball as we get more uh, engagement, as we get more in involvement, we'll get more content, more interest, and the thing will, will, will build of its own accord. So the question, I think hopefully we'll have some time for discussion about that as well as questions on the, on the, on the, on the current version, is what could we do to make this as useful as possible for Royal Roads as a, as a tool for engagement and, and knowledge sharing and, and even joint creation of knowledge. With that, I'll pass it on to Jenny for a quick tour of the, the Rural Opportunities Network. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so what I want to do today is just quickly give you an overview of the site, walk you through um, the three main components that build the site, uh, give you a bit of a taste of some of the content that we've developed, and answer any questions that may come up. So feel free to interrupt me. Um, most websites sort of have one objective, to promote their good or their service. With this site, and this is something that I'm sure Tim will, will touch on when he, when he speaks with us, um, is that we have three main objectives. We wanted to provide information through tools and resources. We wanted to link experts in the field through uh, our network and by providing a, a list of advisors. And we also wanted to give um, small-scale natural resource-based businesses and, and goods and service providers a platform to, um, uh, a platform to advertise their business uh, and, and sort of a way to replace our BBC Wild Directory. So the site is available, it's a, it's a bilingual website, um, and this is sort of a, a result of our East-West partnership with a number of uh, French partners in the East. So I'll just quickly show you. Um, I won't walk you through the French site because I don't think any of us here are bilingual, I know I'm not. Um, but this is the landing page for the site. Uh, in, in French. Uh, it has a different URL. I'll take you back to our home page in English. <clears throat> um, so our first objective to share uh, information and tools and resources uh, is under this section, Learn and Contribute. Um, We've developed a lot of content that lives here. We've collated a lot of content. We've synthesized content, and we've solicited content from other people. Um, our partners uh, and other website users are able to load content and share it under this Share Your Knowledge item here. They, uh, and they complete these fields, provide a description. Um, they can upload the URL or the PDF or any other, any other sort of document and submit, and it'll come to us for approval. I'm going to um, give you a bit of an idea of the sort of content that we've developed, um, keeping in mind that we're still in the, sort of in the middle of the project. It's a living site. We're still developing content, and um, people are still up sharing resources. Under the Rural Opportunities Collection, we've put together a series of um, 
sort of short fact sheets, we called them extension notes in our, in our proposal, um, that synthesize information in a really quick, easy way. And we've, we've also branded it to actually look just like, to reflect the sort of look and feel of our web page. Um, we've contracted with some people to, to write these extension notes. This was a, an extension note created um, by a student last year named Kyle, who was part of SIF, uh, the Students and Free Enterprise Group on campus, that Jeff actually gave us the contact for. Um, we have these, uh, a lot of these extension notes or fact sheets are also available in French. And you'll see that on the English site, uh, we have our French content and our English content together. Um, that was sort of an executive decision that we made to uh, show that we have a lot of content, but also a lot of French speakers um, will understand English content and vice versa. So that was our, our reason for doing that. We've had mixed feedback, um, but so far so good. Um, the other thing I wanted to quickly go over with you were our videos. Um, as part of our application to the Rural Secretariat program, we requested funds to uh, synthesize information in other ways other than a document. So we created a number of videos. We created 15 last year, and we have about four or five in the works this year. Um, they're all under the general theme of rural opportunities. And I'm going to quickly show you, we won't watch the whole video, but we'll uh, watch a little bit of this one, and then I'll show you a few more just to give you sort of a flavor of what they're about. One is a porcini mushroom, for example, or King Boletus, Boletus edulis. That mushroom is great fresh, but it has no shelf life. You never see it in a grocery store. It's highly perishable. It also has much more flavor if it's dried correctly. Um, it concentrates the flavor. Now, some mushrooms, yes, you're concentrating the flavor, but you're actually making a chewy, woody type of product. So there's an art in the drying, and once again, the species matters. Most species of mushrooms you're going to have to process and dry the same day they're harvested. There's some exceptions to the rule, but for bolites, uh, so that's porcini, red tops, uh, slippery jacks, anything like that, they have to be processed the same day. The minute you agitate that mushroom, these are, so these are the Boletus family, the, the larva, the flies, anything in them start moving. And uh, they can't sit, it's lost product. You have, to, you have to slice that up, you have to dry that as soon as possible, and uh, then go through your product and throw away anything that's not good. Morels, chanterelles especially, can be left in a fridge for up to four or five days. That reduces their moisture content slowly and, and is still a safe environment to hold them. But how this typically works for an operation like mine is you're going out, you're getting the mushrooms. You're either working with the harvesters or you're get a, getting them yourself. And then you're bringing them back. Sorry, I'm just going to stop that right there. Um, I had loaded this previously, so we missed the beginning of that. So this was, um, Eric Whitehead is actually uh, a small business owner. He owns Untamed Feast, and he's also a member of our advisory group meeting. And he's um, one of our wild, one of BC's wild mushroom sort of entre business entrepreneurs. He uh, has a very successful business. Um, and we, we worked with him to create this video. Uh, we also worked with a couple of other people on the island last year because it was close uh, to create a number of English videos. This year we had those videos scripted and subtitled so they're available in French. And this is one of them. So uh, I'll just play this for you. Um, this one should start at the beginning so you'll get a sort of sense of how it's branded as well. <laughs> I'm Gary Backlin, and we're just north of the town of Ladysmith, across the harbor. And our property is about 70 acres in size. Um, we have quite a wide-ranging operation, including uh, milling um, hardwoods like maple and alder and arbutus, some cedar and fir. We also do maple syrup, and we do um, sequoia greens, arbutus branches, and we also do native plant nursery uh, and plant rescue. Now, for people that have small properties, 10 acres, 25 acres, 100 acres, or 
um, you know, under, under thousands of acres. Um, managing your property is quite different than, than commercial forestry. It, it just doesn't make sense to try and, and do massive clear cuts on a small piece of property. And you need to try and get um, value. If you just ship logs, you're going to make a little bit of money. But if you can turn those logs into a product or at least lumber, you're going to make more money, um, you're value added. And you might be able to support yourself on a small piece of property. There are always firewood um, opportunities on a small property for selling firewood. Um, lumber, as I mentioned before, is, is usually quite lucrative, especially if you dry it and then sell it for woodworking. Um, floral greens, um, anywhere from Salau, Oregon grape, um, cedar boughs, sequoia boughs, all sorts of things like that, another income. So there's many things you can do um, on a small property to make a, a living or part of a living. The um, equipment we've solved a little bit ourselves. When we first started, we used um, a boat trailer and a farm tractor, and we'd roll logs with PVs. And then as time came by, we actually managed to find a backhoe fairly affordable and, and an old uh, lumber truck that we could haul logs with. Um, neither one were very expensive. So if, if you watch, you can find the right equipment. And they are making equipment now more and more for small-scale forestry, which is great. Sorry, I'll stop one there as well. Um, and then we have a, a third video that I wanted to show you. So Brian mentioned our partners, um, and Biopter uh, has been a major partner with us. They're an, a sort of a similar organization to ours in Quebec. Um, they created a number of videos as well. Here we go. Uh, in French, a little bit, um, the quality is a little bit different, and they're definitely a little bit shorter. Uh, they're probably more accurately termed as clips. Um, but we took the raw footage and sort of had it branded to match the website as well. And I'll just quickly show you this. This, this video is in French. Le cadre archéologique sert principalement à connaître le relief des sites. Le cadre est divisé en 36 carreaux de dimension égale séparés par des cordes. La hauteur de chaque intersection est calculée à l'aide d'un ruban à mesurer. Ces données permettent de connaître la quantité de vide présente dans la chambre de plexiglas lors de la prise de données de CO2. So that was it. Um, very short. Um, we are, like I mentioned, we're still expanding the sort of tools and resources section this year. We've been focusing our efforts on com completing an inventory toolkit geared towards communities interested in sort of assessing what they have in terms of natural resources. That will be branded o along with our, our, our look and feel here and available in French and English. Um, we're also developing case studies, sort of uh, success stories or just even failures, experiences of, of people working in this sector across Canada. Um, and they'll be uh, available online under the tools and resources section as well. <clears throat> so the second part of it was the networking part. Um, we wanted to find, often we get a lot of questions through the center about who to contact about this. and. And where would I find this sort of resource? So we wanted to sort of put these people together in a way where they can connect online. Um, under our Find an Advisors link here, we have a, a number of folks who've signed up, um, and you can see some of them here, who are available to be contacted for any sort of thing. There's a, you can, uh, I'm not sure if you can right now. You can search for advisors by location. And, um, the site has been launched, so we've been getting more and more advisors listing as time goes by. Um, the other section of, or the other component of this section is the events. We've decided to keep past events listed as well because oftentimes people will be looking for conference proceedings or even just a contact from something that they've looked for before. So that's here as well. The third part is the national directory under find buyers and sellers. Um, and again, sort of the, the, uh, the, the driver, the catalyst for creating this was to find a way to replace the BBC Wild Directory. So as you can see, we've sort of expanded that. We've got listings from across Canada. 
and we, by the end of this year, will have listings from Ontario as well. Folks can search for something specific. They can um, browse sellers. If they're looking for somebody, they know their name starts with D or whatever, they can look. And folks can sign up and list their own business as well. Um, an example of what these listings look like. It gives the name, it'll provide uh, an email, a phone number. If, they're, if they have a website, it will provide the URL to the website. And we have a Google map for a location as well. Um, thinking about people who would want to find resources, like the whole buy, buy local thing, if they want to find jams close to themselves, close to them. Um, I think I have a little bit of time. I just wanted to quickly show you how or explain how it would how the site works so since it's a network um, anyone can use it without having to be a member but if you wanted to sign up to for example be listed in the advisors directory or list your business under this login register link um, you create a new account the information is sent to moderators uh, currently myself and Tim and our web developer and uh, we'll, we'll go through it, approve it, edit it for typos. Um, this is our first barrier against spam. <laughs> and you'd be surprised at how many uh, listings I come to work in the morning. There's lots of email from uh, not legitimate people <laughs> requesting an account. Um, under the login register link is also how, for example, I would log in to, to edit content and approve content. The site was built in Drupal. It's hosted currently um, with our web developers uh, server, but it will be migrated to World Road server uh, at the end of the project. And um, I think that's it for now. Yeah, so I'll turn it over to Tim. And thanks for that uh, tour. That was uh, excellent. Uh, made me think about uh, a few things. One thing that I, I did want to just uh, maybe show people was the uh, if you if you're like me and you like to really uh, poke around on a site to see what's on there, we decided to do a sort of a uh, a tag cloud type situation, which was something we didn't start with. But then again, I was thinking about people like myself who actually like to poke around and visually see what's on there, rather than just thinking about using the search mechanism all the time. So this is one thing. This is one of the refinements that we that we've made over the uh, over the over the months of the project. So what um, I'm going to do now is just give you a little bit of a uh, a little bit of a, a picture on um, what's it, what was involved for us in building <laughs> building this building this website. I think to quote uh, uh, you know Jenny, who's done an awful lot of work on this site, I'm never ever going to build a website again. Um, she might get she might get over it. I've heard people say that about having children too, so I probably probably feel the same way. Um, but uh, it it has been a, a you know a really interesting. Oh, I'm doing the wrong thing here. It's been an interesting. No, I'm gonna get rid of that. Sorry. This is, right. So this is um, uh, just a, a content map that was developed by our our web designer uh, Amrus Miller at uh, at Rocket Day. And uh, just to give you some idea of some of the complexity when you're, when you're getting into developing a website that's got a lot of different uh, pages to it and a lot of different connections to it. So I'm just going to go through and talk to you a little bit about, the, uh, about our experience with building the site. And just uh, Brian alluded to, to, to the funders uh, for the project, but I, it's been just to give you some idea of what the design process has been for us, we started off with a, a quite a limited amount of funds that came from a, a Shirk uh, Knowledge Dissemination Fund. And um, there was a small amount of funding in there for website development. So we did begin the process uh, of developing a fairly basic website. I've got a, a screen capture of that to show you. Uh, so a fairly basic website that we started off working on with uh, IT services here at Royal Roads. When we were able to secure uh, significantly more resources through uh, Rural Secretariat in 2011, we realized that we needed a much more ambitious site and a site that um, could, uh, you know, support a lot more functionality of, you know, to, to, to meet the requirements of everything we told the funder that we were going to deliver. 
and uh, there was another change there. We, we decided after quite a bit of discussion that we were going to work directly with the website manager. Um, IT services preferred us originally to be working through them to, uh, with the developer, which um, I understand you know, we still understand part of the reason for doing that. Um, we found it to be a somewhat uh, less than ideal process, um, but at the same time, <laughs> I think we recognize now that there were some benefits to uh, to, to working that way as well. So uh, anyway, we ended up working directly with a website designer and uh, certainly was a, a much more complex site and much more work that we had to do on the, uh, on the design process for the site. So this is the... Um, it's a screen capture of the of the uh, original site, the the basic site that we developed with IT services. Uh, it's on one of the uh, Drupal templates, uh, Drupal being the yeah the the the, the software program that we're using, um, and our content management I guess program is what they call it. And um, you know it 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 did have some of the functionality we we're looking for, but uh, yeah we decided we needed to to take it a, a step forward. And I think uh, you would have got an idea of that from from the, uh, the, the demonstration that Jenny provided. So here were the sort of design steps that <clears throat> we went through once we got that uh, extra funding and began going through, uh, going through the process of designing the new site. And a big thing, of course, visioning is much more than just thinking about who the audience is, but that was, I'm just gonna give you some highlights of, what, of some of the, the challenges and, and some of the things that we faced, is, is we had a very diverse audience. Basically, through this site, we're trying to do multiple things for multiple audiences. So that added a layer of complexity, which I don't think we, we really maybe fully understood before we, we got into it. And I, and I think that's, uh, that was uh, you know, our first sort of lesson in terms of, uh, of developing a, a site like this. Uh, branding and logo development, it wasn't actually part of our original plan to spend a lot of effort on sort of branding and doing it, developing a logo for the site. And we sort of got talked into it by designer, by our designer. I'm, I'm glad now in hindsight that he did talk us into it, um, but it turned into, out to be something that was much more involved. Um, I can also say that everyone's a critic when you send around the idea for a logo. Everybody's got a different idea of what they want to see. I'm, I'm happy now with, with what we ended up with, um, but it was uh, yeah, kind of an interesting process. Um, once we got into actually building the site and the site design, um, there were challenges. When I say challenges of working in Drupal, Drupal is, uh, is, is, the, is the software that, that uh, is the program that, that uh, Royal Road supports. So we had to think about, okay, what happens after we're finished working with our designer who's ex external to Royal Roads? How is it going to be supported? And um, so we, we made the commitment to work in Drupal. He, unfortunately, was much more comfortable with WordPress, which is another uh, program. And so we ended up with, uh, you know, some challenges of him having to, to uh, find his way in Drupal. And, and we ended up working with actually the person who developed the original site, uh, the small site, when, who was working with us uh, through IT services. And, and she's a Drupal expert. So we managed to solve that. There's been a lot of challenges in developing a bilingual site. We committed ourselves to developing a bilingual site when we wrote the proposal. I'm still a big believer that's what we, we wanted to do. We wanted to work with partners right across the country. It's created all kinds of issues in, in unforeseen ways in terms of making, uh, you know, the, the the back door or whatever of the of the the program actually function properly. So that's presented a lot of challenges and I would caution you that if you're thinking about doing a bi bilingual site to really get some good advice on that before uh, before committing too much to that. Uh, and um, we did go through testing and revisions which are which were really important for us. We did some of the concerns we had, we sort of had a feeling that there was something that wasn't working quite right, but I think when we actually took it out to the audience and got them to, uh, uh, to, to, to work through it uh, with us, um, we were able to find a, a number of uh, uh, solutions to some of those, uh, some of those issues. Um, and just to tell you a little bit about some of those uh, some of those challenges and lessons that we learned is that you know visioning seems like it should be a straightforward process, but only if you have a straightforward audience. We had multiple audiences, and uh, that created some some challenges for us. Testing, I already talked about. I won't go into any more detail on that. But we did make it. We have made a number of changes, and I, I'm glad in some ways that we've had the time that we've had to work through the development of the site because we have we have made uh, some changes, and it always takes <coughs> excuse me always takes time. 
Um, this is something I'm always keeping in mind, I constantly thinking about, okay, how is the site going to be used, who's going to be using it, and I really think you need to keep that very much in the forefront of your mind when you're, when you're working with uh, um, site development. Um, budget, same story with probably pretty much every project we ever do. Budget always more than more money than you think you're going to need, and I have a slide on that uh, next to show you that. And finally, uh, I, Emrys has done. I think I hope you'll agree that when you see when you see the the site and how uh, and its appearance and everything else, Emrys, our designer, has done a really great job. But he does work in a slightly different um, realm than some of us do, and. Uh, yeah, it's been an interesting process. Uh, some things that we thought would be quite simple and straightforward actually turned out to be much more complex, and sometimes we wonder why they were more complex. But um, it's been a good result, but it's, uh, it's been a, a bit of a road getting there. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to share with you, in case you're thinking about for, for some project that you're uh, in the process of developing and you think, wow, it would be great to throw a couple of thousand dollars in there and develop a website. Well, depending on what kind of a website and how involved it is and who you're going to be working with on that site, um, it, it can be, uh, yeah, quite a little, bit, quite a bit more expensive than uh, than, than you might imagine. Um, when we developed the simple site, which I think you know was was still a nice site and did have a number of features to it that were that were you know quite attractive, uh, uh, we came in around about what the what the budget was that we had through the through the shirk dollars for for that uh, for that site. Uh, the more involved and complex site and involving a, a you know a designer in the processes ended up being. Uh, considerably more costly. Um, there were, you know, a lot of issues that came up, I, again, around the bilingualism. I, I'm not sure how much it cost us to develop a bilingual site over what it would have been to just develop a, a unilingual site, but certainly the cost was was significantly higher there. And uh, we've had a number of areas where we thought it was going to work one way, and as I said, we went back, tested it, and realized, you know what, this is just not, not good enough, so we had to modify it. So all those costs do add up, and I would, I would point out that that's what basically the contracted dollars for, for the design and, uh, and build of the site. That's not including time that, uh, that Jenny and myself have put into various discussions about what the site should look like. So that's just to give you a little bit of a picture of uh, you know our experience in building the site. There's much more. I'm sure Brian could add more and Jenny could add more, but uh, we just wanted to give you a quick overview and leave some time for for questions and just to follow on from from what Brian uh, uh, said in terms of questions. Anything that you're you're curious about, whether it's the process of building the website, uh, and we are happy to share our budgets with you if you want to see what cost what in case you're going down this path yourself. And also we're very, as, as Brian said, we're very, we're very keen to, to see how this site could support um, other researchers within the, uh, within the Royal Roads community. Um, we do have some student papers that we put up there already. Um, as Jenny mentioned, we had a great experience working with SIFE here at, at Royal Roads on developing some of the, uh, some of the, um, uh, the, the papers for, for putting on the site. But I think there are you know, numerous other opportunities for us to see some stuff getting out there. If you have papers that you think are relevant, that you're not sure you're going to take through the whole process to publish them more formally, then uh, you know, by all means, uh, we'd, we'd love to see them get up on our site. So I think that's uh, about it for now. So thanks very much, and hope there's some questions to go with this. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. We will go to questions. Since we have a bit of time, I just wanted to acknowledge our, our advisory uh, group which includes Jeff here. Uh, we have Ajit Krishnaswamy, who's with uh, Forex, a provincial forest uh, research extension agency. Eric Whitehead, who you saw, who's a, a local entrepreneur and expert in uh, mushrooms and non-timber forest products. Eric Jones from the Institute for Culture and Ecology, which is at a, a Seattle, uh, uh, Portland-based Portland uh, organization that also does research on non-timber forest products. Um, uh, Gerald Legal, who is a, uh, an entrepreneur and uh, w working in, in, in Quebec. Maxime Tardif from Biopter, who uh, uh, Tim talked about. Leanne Elliott from the uh, uh, Canadian Model Forest Network. And Wendy Drummond has also been contributing. So that's uh, some idea of the people that have been participating. Jenny showed some of the content. In terms of our, uh, the question I asked earlier in terms of uh, how we can use it at, at Royal Roads, there's a lot of content there that is sort of summaries of research that we have done. 
we want to put full uh, papers. We want to have a, a repository there for, for journal articles and things to make those easily accessible. But I think it's also an interesting place when we think about student research, where students could go actually to try and identify research questions, because there is a dialogue there, there is a, there is a network, and as it builds, it will become more important as a place where researchers can help to define what is the right question, what, it, what would be important and relevant to, a, to, to this community that I, that I want to work with. And so that's another way I think we, we can use a network like that. So those are just some su suggestions. You've had a kind of a quick, uh, quick overview of it. I hope you'll uh, take a few minutes when you've got a, a chance sometime to have a look uh, in a little bit more detail at the website. Uh, but in the meantime, we'd like to put the floor open for, for questions and, and further discussion on some of these issues. Thanks. Yeah. Um, it, it looks fabulous, and I just wonder, uh, is there anything else like this in Canada? How, how uh, just give me some context, how important is this? Uh, actually, probably, Evelyn, you probably looked at more of this, the other sites that are out there than, than, than even I have, so. Okay, well, yeah, I, I can speak a little bit. So I've, um, so I'm Evelyn Hamilton, and I've been working with folks here on, um, on this initiative, particularly lately, just trying to expand the uh, reach of it. Um, so one thing I've done is work with the Facebook site and load material up to that, set up a Twitter account, which makes do it so we have a Twitter handle. And that's actually brought a lot of new attention to it and, and links with other organizations. But, um, and also I'm looking at where are some other funding opportunities. So in order to do that, I did a fairly extensive search to what are the other organizations that are doing something similar you know, where do we fit in that sort of whole big Venn diagram of organizations. So there are organizations that support, you know, small business um, generally, or a regional sector, like the Columbia Basin and we, uh, Rural uh, Development Institute. And, but there's nothing that's really um, takes this kind of sector and focuses on it, the, the smallest to medium scale natural resource based enterprises and provides sort of the, the kind of dynamic part of the links with to experts, the updating with the sort of summaries of information, and um, the updated people to contribute their information. And the fact that it's national is another way it's distinct from a lot of other uh, networks which may be you know, provincial in scope. Or, um, but I think it would be an interesting exercise to actually diagram that out and see you know, exactly where, where the piece is. And, um, and I was interested to see that in the Columbia Basin, actually the rural opportunities World um, Development Institute is doing something similar in the Columbia Basin area. They're looking at what are all the different resources for small enterprises. You know, what services do they provide, and, and you know, where can they, as an organization, best fit into the mix? So, that's an interesting research question to look at. Uh, what's, what's Jeff, so uh, what does governance look like in the future? Who runs the show? Uh, you know, uh, is Jenny signed up for these emails in perpetuity, or you know, what, what happens with that? Jenny's going to be just sitting at home for the next year, right? <laughs> so she'll have plenty of time. <laughs> uh, that's something we really have to work out, and actually, we've got a meeting next week to think about funding for going forward. Uh, but. It, it partly depends on what we think about within Rural Roads and could we expand this to, to, to get more engagement from, from other faculty and uh, I, I don't really know. I think it's quite open and there's a lot of different ways to go forward and there is a, a meeting of the advisory group uh, not next week but the week after and that will also be a, an important issue for you guys to discuss. I can add a little bit to that. Um, we do have a lawn inbox so it's currently loaded on internal machines, but it's something we can look at in the next couple of weeks is sharing that amongst our partners and making some of our key partners more users of the site as well. Um, and in terms of uh, the infrastructure of the website, um, our year is committed to hosting it and to perpetuity for us. And we have met with IT services, and they've also committed to under their research portfolios and helping to help us address any issues that may come up each quarter. So whereas we have someone working with a direct contract with us now to, to fix anything that we want fixed, um, we will have to do a little bit more So that's kind of the big steps that's where we are right now. I just maybe add one more thing. Um, you know, being, being realistic about it, um, I think we all would have liked our partners to step up a little more actively than maybe has been the case. And perhaps we were a little bit 
naive, maybe we weren't completely realistic about that because it's true that you know the funding flows through us and certainly we've we've benefited in a sense. I mean we've done the majority of the work and we certainly had the majority of the resources come come to us. Um, but we're hoping at our next advisory meeting to sort of you know encourage our, our various partners to also be a little bit more active um, on the site. Um, but you know it's, it's I think it's a classic issue and I, I haven't heard anybody who's really you know, been able to, 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 to crack that nut so easily that, uh, you know, people are really, really busy, right? And, you know, we want other people to, to put some effort into it, but we're still, you know, still trying to find the best way forward on that. I think there's still a perception with our advisory group that, oh, it's, it's well, it's still, it's kind of raw roads. Yeah, well, great, we're all part of it, but it's kind of raw roads, this thing. And we are leading, it's true, we are the lead on it. And there's expectations that we're going to continue to make all these things happen. But we are going to need, obviously, more, more, more support and, and input and resources from other folks. One thing I'm following that I can mention is um, there's an opportunity through the um, agroforestry initiative, which is a provincial funding source for things related to agroforestry, to which Vaughan actually fits in really nicely in terms of a, because they're, they're all about extending information related to agroforestry. Universities can't apply for the funding, but we, uh, we're working with the um, Community Forest Association, who's quite interested in taking the lead on, on this piece. And one part that in particular would be a good link with us is that by up Terry Quebec has a lot of information on agroforestry that could be uh, translated and, and linked into it. So mm -hmm. we're just working with um, Community Forest Association right now to see if they can kind of take on this proposal piece to, to get funding from the Agroforestry Institute. You mentioned um, that the site was tested earlier on with um, some people, and I just wondered if there are any other plans to assess its success or maybe to do some of the rain to find Yeah, um, so as part of that, it was, it was part of our deliverables for last, I think a few weeks last was going to highlight the site um, to travel to uh, the lower North Shore. St. Lawrence, for that, yeah. with a small little community, <coughs> sort of our target on having a few more folks and stuff. We got a lot of feedback from yeah. them for what we did to the site build. Um, I didn't go over it, but you may have seen the little feedback button in the top nomination. Um, we haven't been getting feedback through there. And uh, I don't know if we're going to advise group members, um, friends and family, our uh, web designer, his network, um, is yeah. also giving us feedback. And there is We've also been tracking our Facebook links and our Twitter followers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, the last thing that Tim mentioned was that, that it might have potential for um, people submitting their research publications to the site. Have you thought down the road what that might evolve into? Um, and not just a repository for already produced stuff, but an actual place where publications can get a start. I haven't thought about that idea. That's, that's a very interesting mm -hmm. idea. Mm -hmm. No, that's maybe something to put on the agenda for the yeah. advisory group as an issue. The other question I have is about advertising. Um, I mean, people are contributing to this site and getting their names there. They're getting exposure, right? Mm -hmm. um, is there potential for advertising um, down the road to sustain this? Cost recovery potential? This is, this is an area where we have very little expertise and not a lot of success. Uh, the, um, the IBC Wild Directory, we managed to put together on a shoestring with support of a few funders that helped us put it together. And we thought that the service was valuable enough that listers would be willing to pay uh, to be listed because it's, it's advertising. And in fact, uh, when we did a survey and tried to explore that, we found uh, we, got a, uh, we didn't get a very good reaction. Some people were willing, many didn't reply, of course, mm -hmm. and a lot uh, responded that they, that they wouldn't, that they wouldn't be willing to, 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 to pay for that. Now, this may be uh, more attractive, uh, and, there, and, there, and there might be mechanisms that we could use, and I, I, I'm probably forgetting some of the discussions that we've had. Uh, but it's an area where we could really use some advice from people who know how to do these things and how, who know how to get money out of a website. We just know how to put it in. 
So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. That's right. The organic farmers, the mushroom farmers, they, they get exposure. To oh, sure. There's a, and, and I think that by now, the, the, because it does have a, what it does is it, it helps, in the IBC Wild Directory, we basically distributed in the, in the, in the lower mainland and on the island, and it was a lot of uh, um, listers were, were, were local, and it helped them expand from local maybe to a, a small regional market. This actually allows people to expand to a, to a national and, and even to a, an international level. So it, it certainly has in, inherent value, but the trick is how do you convert that into... And it may be that we, we can get it to the point where we can start to charge. Uh, if you want to be listed, then, then, then you have to pay. The trouble we had with the By BC Wild directory was that as soon as we reduce the number of listees, it becomes a much less attractive publication. So you've always got that kind of thing to balance. And there's probably people that know how to deal with that, maybe in our own uh, faculty of management. <laughs> yeah. And don't, and don't forget the School of Communication and Culture, where we have um, uh, complementary expertise around uh, building a buzz yeah. and a conversation with various kinds of audiences, which then allows uh, trust to develop and a relationship to develop so that then the marketing and the shopping and the advertising, yeah. uh, all yeah. of that sort of monetary stuff can happen. I can also see many opportunities for this in the BA, uh, Professional Communication Program, as a, to bring this site and some of the people involved into the classroom for case studies in several of our courses. Um, uh, we have uh, a course called uh, Professional Experience where students are asked to go and work with a client to help them with communication challenges mm -hmm. and uh, they're allowed to work with teams. We could, we could oh, offer this. I mean, it would be great for students because they wouldn't have to go downtown yeah. to see their client. They would have their client here on campus and they'd be working on something really important. Many of our students are really committed to sustainability. Mm -hmm. and they, idea. You know, uh, no so management they, people ever like having it. <laughs> <laughs> but they're good, and they um, they have one course, a digital media course, where it's precisely their job to build a community of interest and measure um, and measure how much how many hits. And that. so, when I heard you talking about Twitter, I thought uh, students would definitely be able to um, not only uh, help you create an editorial schedule for blog posts and Twitter. Twitter posts, uh, but also to help you manage those and to help you measure and show to funders. Um, you know, the success of what you're doing, who you're reaching in the world, and, and uh, what, what the conversation is like. So that's just, a, and that's just the BA level. I'm sure if we had some people uh, who are running the MA programs, they would know. Uh, uh, certainly it would be great, for instance, if you came into our first residency in the MA program and talked about this as a possible place for students to start thinking about a major research paper or thesis project the next following year and start creating um, and, and ask for the students' feedback. What, what are the research questions we're not asking for? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. When is the next right. residence? Uh, the MAs are just finishing right now. That'll start again next year. And I'm having an online student. Uh, for the BAPSI online uh, uh, program, this would be great because our students are all over Canada. Mm -hmm. And their residency starts pre residency April. They're here in May. Yeah. Okay. And then our on campus people are here mm -hmm. in. Uh, they come in September for residency. So we can coordinate the schedules. And oh, great, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Super. Can I just, uh, it's kind of on the same heading, but um, I kind of worry that you know, this, the, the opening is super important remarks here. But I thought I would ask, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of stuff coming into this site and sort of being, being put up on it. I wondered if you were taking a more kind of active, outgoing uh, path at any point. You know, like you have, you talked about uh, uh, Facebook links and things. Do you have do you have kind of news going out on Facebook? Do people sign up and receive information? <laughs> Is there a list sort of thing going on on the website? Um, it's built into the website that there could be a list sort. Uh, we haven't had <laughs> used that budget in other areas, mm -hmm. um, so that's something that you know, in the future we can look at revitalizing. Mm -hmm. So there's no currently there's no list sort through the website. Um, we had our, our hard launch what, just a few weeks ago, three or four weeks ago now, and we have 
45 likes on Facebook. It's growing every week. That's good. Um, so we, and, and we, everyone's been a big help in this. We've been um, you know, just profiling different content that we have and that sort of thing, linking with other like-minded initiatives on, on Facebook. So uh, if you can like, then you can also mm -hmm. you can also click on like keep me informed. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we're showing up in people's news feeds. Yeah, that would yeah. be great. Mm -hmm. But we don't have anything strategic around our sort of outreach and promotion campaign in terms of social media right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our BA students are starting their advertising and PR course in uh, April and one of their projects, they could, some of them could work on your case yeah. if you like. It's, it's very worthwhile and uh, the MA program has an organizational challenge that they do in their organizational communication course. Great. They can That's help you with that too. Exactly so we need to yeah. 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 Super. And, and generally. Okay. Okay. Perfect. I'll set that up. Okay. I really like the site. I got it hit me on the eyes. No, I did. It, it, it really did appeal to me. Great. And it's not a subject I normally think about really. Yeah. So from that perspective, you know, yeah. I like it. No, it does but it I looks, would definitely nice, yeah. peruse around on. And, and, it, and right away I had um, already came to my mind a couple of our Masters of Interdisciplinary Studies students. There's one in particular I'm, I'm thinking right away, oh, I need to tell her about this mm -hmm. because up in the Northwest Territories and a major project involved or something similar to your content. Yeah, yeah, I think it would be great if we could start to get students research yeah. or, you know, published in some form or another on here and there may be links that they can make through the, through it. So yeah. the more of those sorts of links we can, we can make, the better. Thank you. We've got one in the MAIC who's working on uh, local food. Right? Oh, yeah? Yeah. Oh. Well, and, and I can't speak for higher level administration, but if all of the schools are getting involved in the use of this site, you would think there would be resources you would. to help you support the site. In-house. In-house. <laughs> yeah. One would hope. <laughs> uh, because it actually has a, a, quite a bit of pedagogical value. Mm -hmm. I mean, real value. Yeah, we came to hire um, uh, a student for the year, right? Yeah. yeah. I think that would be, yeah. that would be a start. Yeah. And I, you know, I think it's a really good demonstration of what Royal Roads promotes, which is the applied aspect of our of our research agenda. We want to make sure that the research is useful and used, and this is one way to make that to make that link. So. And it's bringing together so many disciplines. Mm -hmm. It's really beautifully interdisciplinary. Great. Anything else? And shall I close, Vanessa? Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, really. I appreciate you, you coming. Thank you. Thank you. Great to see you. And have a look at some of the videos. There's some really fun ones. Yeah. <laughs>